Well, the actual act of writing, we will begin in lesson uh, 5.3, which occurs on day 5. But today's lesson, which follows this video, 5.2, um, in essence obliges you, it, it simulates the act of writing. It obliges you to make the kinds of choices um, uh, regarding spelling that you have to make when you're actually writing. And so we begin, uh, before we begin the, the simulated act of writing today, I want to talk about two different topics that will help you be more successful, successful today, but successful also in the long run once you start writing. And those topics are what are called diacritical marks, or we'll just refer to them as accent marks. And um, uh, also, I'm going to talk about what it is that causes the writing of French to be very challenging, for it's a more difficult language to write than, say, uh, Spanish, which is a phonetic language. So uh, let's start with accent marks first of all. There are five different types. The first, probably the most common, is the accent aigu, or acute accent. And that is an accent which, you, as you see here, appears over the letter E and only over the letter E. It creates a sound E, E, as opposed to the E or E, which uh, uh, the letter E can uh, occasionally have as its, as its pronunciation. With the accent aigu, or the acute accent, it will always be pronounced E. And although pronunciation isn't the topic of this video, notice how I'm saying e, e. Remember, purity of sound, chop the vowel sound short, don't let your, anything change in the shape of your mouth, your teeth, your, 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 your lips, your tongue, whatever. Nothing moves once you start pronouncing a vowel in French. E, e. Okay. So here's some examples of uh, the, the uh, accent aigu on, uh, uh, on the letter E in French. Here's a classic example. and something which I'm sure you're probably dreaming about right now. It's it, actually, you're at this point of the year. You're probably not dreaming about it. You're more likely regretting or, uh, yeah, experiencing remorse over it. It's été, été, which is the word summer, which I, I fear is is rapidly uh, disappearing. Uh, été, été is summer. See, the accent aigu appears on both e's in this in this word. Uh, the second word, trouve. Well, trouve doesn't have that accent aigu in it. However, if I put the accent aigu or the cute accent on the e at the end, it suddenly becomes from trouve. It changes to trouver. Trouver. Trouve is he finds. Il trouve. Uh, trouver is found as an adjective. Trouver. Uh, and then here's another good example right here with the accent aigu is the word éléphant. Éléphant. It's good because um, you because of its similarity to English, you're going to want to say elephant. <laughs> elephant. Remember to remember that the accent aigu on the letter e always creates the sound e. Never compromise it. Never cause it to, to to resemble English just because, for example, it precedes the the consonant L. It's e. It's always e. So éléphant. Okay. The second of the um, accent marks is the accent grave or the grave accent, and that appears for two different reasons on vowels, and not just on the letter e. On the letter e, it will appear and create the sound e, e. For example, in uh, this, you know this already. Lève. Il se lève. Lève. Um, it cre creates a sound, eh. Uh, here's a, a good example because here you have both the accent aigu and the accent grave in the same word, élève. You see the e is the accent aigu, and you notice how the, the accent grave runs in the opposite direction, and it creates a sound, eh, e, e, le, lève, élève. Um, uh, thirdly, gère, gère, gère means to manage something. Okay, gère, il gère a magasin. He, he manages a store, for example. Notice the original form in parenthesis of the of, of uh, gère. It's gérer. That should tip you off to the fact that uh, uh, words in French can change their pronunciation as you go from the original uh, verb, specifically the original form of the verb, to the conjugated form. We have gé, gérer is the verb to manage, and once you conjugate it, however, it's je gère. Tu gères, il gère, nous gérons, vous gérez, il gère. So four of those six forms, the sound was eh, eh. Okay, now, let me talk about this accent, uh, the accent gra uh, grave on the letter E. How will I know when it should be employed? Okay, what should be used? There is actually a rule you can apply which will allow you never to miss when you should have an accent grave. If, in a word, uh, you have E followed by a consonant followed by another E, in that last e, the second e is silent. Then the first of the two of the two e's will have the accent grave. Uh, you look at each of these examples here. Look at lève. You have e followed by a v followed by e, which is silent. 
and you and we say ev in elev again you have e v e the first e is has the accent grave because it's followed by a consonant and then by a silent e and then in jere uh, why does it change sounds well because uh, we have an e consonant e which requires in the second e the last e is in the conjugated form jer is silent it requires therefore an accent grave on the first e and that accent grave makes the sound e eh. Not e, so that's why it goes from uh, gérer to gère in the in the uh, conjugated form of the verb. So the, remember, just remember this principle: if you have e followed by a consonant followed by a silent e, that first e will have an accent grave, and its pronunciation will be e. Eh. Now there's a second use of the accent grave, and that is as a a means of distinguishing between two identically spelled words. You know two examples already. You may not realize it, but um, uh, the word a, uh, a. Uh. Now, where have you seen a uh, used? Well, you know it in the verb avoir. So he has, he or she, il, elle, a. Uh. Okay, that's just spelled with the letter a. The same uh, letter, the letter a, however, is used in a, uh, which means at or to. Il va à l'école. Il va à l'école. That. Uh, letter A, to show the difference between it and the verb avoir, uh, it has an accent grave, uh, which is, is simply there to show the distinction between it and the verb avoir, which otherwise would be identically spelled. Another example of, of that, uh, using the accent grave to distinguish between identically spelled words, is the word ou. Uh, ou, which means or, O-U, has no accent mark. Ou, which means where, ou, uh, has, of course, the accent grave on the letter U. And its purpose there, it doesn't change the pronunciation whatsoever. Ou meaning or, or ou meaning where, identically pronounced. It's just to show the difference in writing between these two words. Okay, so that's accent grave. The next one's a little quicker. Uh, the tréma, which are two dots over a vowel in French, are there to, to cause the, the speaker to pronounce, or the reader to pronounce, both vowels independently, one of another. Most common word you know, it's a word which is known worldwide, is Noël, which is the French word for Christmas. Joyeux Noël, a Merry Christmas. Uh, Noël. If you did not have the, the tréma over the letter E, then you would pronounce the O and the E together in a single syllable. Nol, nol. But having the tréma tells you to pronounce each independently in separate syllables. Noël. Okay? Another example of that is the word where, or excuse me, the word corner, the word corner is a coin. Okay, you see how it's spelled, coin. You have O and I, which pronounce, you know, through your phonics studies, uh, creates the sound wa. The N following them uh, obliges you to nasalize or pronounce through your nose the sound wa, which becomes wa. And coin is the word for corner. Now, here's a, the same series of letters. In the word coincidence, obviously you can tell by its spelling, uh, but it's not coincidence. Coin is corner, so this you'd think would be coincidence. It's coincidence. co -in, two separate syllables, because the two dots, the tréma over the letter I, uh, causes this to be, to be pronounced coincidence, uh, causing the two vowels to be pronounced independently one of another. Okay, that's a tréma. doesn't occur very often, don't no. Don't worry about it. Uh, the letter um, um, the letter C is the fourth example. The letter C followed by A, O, or U is typically a hard C sound. Uh, C, A, like in car, which means as, or C, O, like in what, what verbs you know. Uh, uh, commencer, que, que, que. Okay? Um, and, and so followed by A, O, and U, the C is going to be hard. Followed by E or I, it's going to be pronounced in a soft fashion. S, like in, uh, I just said the word S, which means this, ce uh, uh, garçon, this boy, for example. Um, so what happens if you want to follow a C with an A, O, or U, which would create a hard C sound, but you want it to be a soft C sound? Can you think of any examples where you, you've seen a little... This is called, I haven't told you what we're, we're looking about, we're talking about yet. Yeah, we're talking about the, the little hook under the C that's called the cédille. Cédille is that little hook under the C. Okay, have you seen any words already with that little hook under the C you can think of? I know you have. You've seen one probably numerous times. Um, uh, I'll give you a clue. It has to do with a male, not an adult. Yeah, garçon. 
garçon. If you took that little hook off, you would be obliged to pronounce it garçon. But it's garçon. garçon. The C followed by O should be hard, but it becomes soft when that little hook is placed under it, even if it's followed by A, O, or U. Uh, another example of that, uh, this is a word we often see actually written even in English when we're talking about the architecture of a home. Uh, uh, the facade. Facade. The facade of a house, the front of the house, uh, the facing. Uh, uh, facade in French. Uh, it would be pronounced facade if there were no little hook, little cédille under the C. But that cédille makes the, the C soft even though it's followed by an, by an A. Got it? Okay. And then the fifth, uh, the fifth is kind of interesting, historically interesting, I guess you'd say, because uh, the little hat or the roof people refer to it as, it's called a circumflex. Circumflex, a little roof over, over a vowel. Um, uh, the circumflex is actually there to, sh to show that in old French, centuries ago, uh, an S appeared in the word at one time following the vowel which, is, which has the uh, circumflex over it. And let me show you some examples. You can see how you, you could easily discern that um, an S once uh, would have appeared there and what the word means. For example, the word ma. You see the word ma right here. You see the circumflex over the A. Okay, it's not going to change the spelling. We're not going to. Uh, uh, we're not going to modify this. I'm, I'm sorry. We're not going to change the pronunciation because the circumflex is there. It's just there to show you that at one time uh, an s appeared in the word. Well, a ma is a, a a part of a sailing vessel. What's a ma? Yeah, it's a mast. It's the mast of a of a sailboat. Um, how about this next word? Fet. No, you actually you actually use this word in English occasionally. Um, this French word. Fet. What is that circumflex? What does this word mean? What do you think? You may have been exposed to it in English, and you know fet refers to party, to fet someone, is to, to have a party for them. Uh, uh, add an S in there, and what does this word suggest after the E? Fest. Well, you think of the word festival, uh, and if you add an extra vowel in there in English, you have the word feast. So this has the idea of a party, a celebration of some kind. In France, a fet uh, is um, it's a holiday, like la fête nationale is the national holiday. But of course, it harkens back to the idea you'd probably have a celebration with food and a big feast on such an event. It's just a special day. Uh, here's another one: il, il. Okay, see the circumflex over the. And by the way, when there's a circumflex or a tréma over the letter i, there is no dot on the i. Okay, so you see the circumflex over the i. What was this? What do you think this word means? Yeah, an isle. In other words, an island. Uh, is the word il. And then, uh, oh, by the way, why are there so many French words that are very closely related to English? Well, I got a minor in history, but frankly, I didn't really pursue it seriously enough. So I'm not going to talk to you too much about William the Conqueror and the Battle of Hastings in 1066, but there was a time when uh, 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 Guillaume le Conquérant, uh, Duke of Normandy, ruled over uh, England as well, I think. And in any case, the court in England used French quite readily, and thereby French words seeped into what's now the uh, the English language. And so don't be surprised that so many words here really have a, a, a tight uh, correlation to English if there are historical reasons for it. All you historians out there can write to me by uled1 at gmail.com and correct me on my facts. Um, next, um, oh, how about the this word right here in... Uh, uh, over the circumflex over it. What's this word mean? Yeah, in uh, hôtesse is a hostess. Hôte ot is a host. So hôtesse. And then last of all, this is the, the most rare, a circumflex over letter U. There are only 246 words. I looked that one up. That one don't write to me about. It's true. 246 words in French uh, which have a circumflex over the letter U. Uh, but this is an easy one to recognize. What do you think coup, well, maybe sort of easy. What do you think le coup means? Well, it's the cost. Le coup is the cost of something. Okay, so those are the five diacritical marks. We'll call them accent marks. And hopefully that little introduction there will help you as you um, begin your, the, the process of writing. Next, what is it that makes French so difficult to write? Why is it so hard to write? Well, simply put, I believe that the primary challenge is because of the, the frequency of silent letters that appear in French. Unlike Spanish, where you write exactly what you say is what you write. In, in, Spanish, in French, unfortunately, you have lots of silent letters to bear in mind and to, and to realize why uh, in, that they are there. Here we go. Um, 
Here's the general principle. And that, that's my approach, really, is always give you the general principles, not the details, not, and not the exceptions. The general principles, okay? The general principle I want you to bear in mind is that final, or consonants in general, not just final ones, consonants or series of consonants, uh, two or three in a row, for example, um, will not be pronounced unless they are followed by a vowel. Let me show you what I mean. How do you say he goes out? I say, il sort, right? Il sort. Here's how it's written. Whoa, what's that T doing in there? That's one of those silent consonants I was talking to you about. Now, the R was pronounced. There's no cotton, there's no vowel after it. I told you, focus on the general rules. Don't deal with the exceptions. I'll talk about the exceptions in a second, but I'll basically downplay them. Uh, uh, so, il sort. The T is not pronounced because there's no vowel after it. Now, uh, uh, if I say sort, il sort, and that can be said on certain occasions, it's called the subjunctive mood, um, uh, uh, the T becomes pronounced because, look what's after it, a silent E. The e, silent E is the most common silent letter you're going to deal with. It will be there to make final consonants pronounced, or what would otherwise be the final consonant in the word pronounced, the final letter in the word. So, il sort, I pronounce the T because there's a silent E after it. Look at this next one here. How do you think I pronounce this series of seven letters? Uh, the, the previous word with five letters, S-O-R-T-E, was sort. How do you think you say this? Well, if you're following my general principle, and that's what I want you to focus on, um, the N does not have a vowel after it. The T does not have a vowel after it. And therefore, uh, the second T, I should say, only that first T will still be pronounced. If S-O-R-T-E was sort, this is il sort. Also, uh, no, the il changed, by the way, you may have noticed, but that's a different topic. Huh? Uh, uh, sort, okay? The N and T are silent because there's no vowel after them. That's a challenge. So the word sort could be spelled S-O-R-T-E. It could be spelled S-O-R-T-E-N-T. -E and if I want to get ridiculous, let me throw another letter on here. It could be pronounced S-O-R-T-E-N-T-G. And I could keep adding more and more, I suppose, consonants, but that's getting a little carried away. Okay, so the general principle is this. If a, if a consonant is not followed by a vowel, it will not be pronounced. If it is pronounced, but you don't hear the vowel after it, like an a ah or an o oh or a u oh or a u, uh, that must be a silent e that's following that, that consonant to make it pronounced. Okay, now, for those of you who like rules, those of you who are analytical and you'd like to have a, uh, uh, know all of the exceptions, I won't give you all the exceptions. I'll just tell you that there is an acrostic you can come up with, which is CRFL, and we make the word careful out of CRFL. Words ending in C. R, F, and L frequently, not always, and that's the key, frequently will be have the fi final C, R, F, L pronounced, like in avec, avec, which means with, you've already experienced that, the C is pronounced, or like pour, which means for, or in order to, that R is being pronounced, or like souf, which means except, the F is pronounced, or like in général, which is, of course, general, um, the L is pronounced, but... Even those exceptions have exceptions that go in the other direction. So don't let, let us not muddle our, our thinking, fill our minds with the exceptions. Let's focus on the general rule. How you learn the exceptions? You learn the exceptions through reading, through being ex exposed to them through reading, and through repetitive exercises, and that's what Unit 5 is all about within the ULAT, where you, you will deal with these uh, you'll see these words like pour and avec and souf on a repeated basis. Maybe not souf, that doesn't appear too much in Unit 5, but um, uh, those, those are exceptions and they will not, uh, they will not, they don't merit our primary attention. So one more time, general rule. Do not pronounce a consonant or series of consonants unless followed by a vowel. If you hear a consonant at the end of a word, Almost certainly, it's followed by a silent E that is making it pronounced. All right, I've said enough. I'm going to set you loose now on Lesson 5.2. You're going to simulate writing. Bon courage. Au revoir.